Uh, so this morning we're, we're starting a series, uh, The Radical Sayings of Jesus from Ministry Matters. Um, let me be clear about one, one thing, though, is that there are way more radical sayings than six. Jesus was revolutionary, and he, he turned um, the understandings of the Pharisees, Sadducees, the scribes on its head in many, many ways in many different times. So we're going to be uh, tackling some of these uh, as we go forward. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting that that passage, Brad, that, that you just picked up, because today is going to be, be anxious for nothing. I don't, I don't know if you knew that or not, but God is good. <laughs> so he was willing to go to the folks that the, the regular church people, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, all those guys wouldn't go to. He would go to the outcasts and the dregs of the society. They got on him about it. They said, what are you doing? You know, those guys are unclean. Those guys are not the place. You need to come and be with us so you can be part of our group, uh, more or less. Uh, but he, he was here to save those who were lost, and, and he went to them. You know, he went out to them. And the church has always been, that our primary mission really is to go into the world and, and make disciples of all men and women. So he was a radical person, but his agenda was godly. He, he came into this world with his father's agenda, and his father's work came first. And nothing else was really that close in priority, except maybe loving and discipling his disciples. You know, He spent a lot of time with them, and he tried to teach them so that they could teach those who followed, so that those disciples might disciple other disciples, who in turn might disciple other disciples disciples who might then disciple others. And we sit here today because disciples make disciples. And somebody in our life took the time to disciple us, to draw us closer to God. But make no mistake, Jesus, Jesus was not here to make us comfortable. He, he, makes, he, puts, he challenges us in many ways. He puts us in constantly in uncomfortable situations so that he can be glorified. Ask Gideon about that. Send 300. Get, send, send your army home. You know? Okay, now you got 300? Okay, that's good. Now you can fight this 100,000 man army, you know? And, oh, and by the way, use some pots and break some pots and scream really loud and blow some trumpets. And that's your game, that's your game plan. <laughs> you know, and you're going to win. And guess what happened, though? He won. But he, and and who's, who gets the glory? God. You know, God gets the glory. The nature of an authentic Christian walk is a willingness to be uncomfortable for God. I ran across this this past week, and I just absolutely love it. Jesus did not come to accommodate culture. He came to counter it. He did not come to accommodate culture. He came to counter culture. And some of these things that we're going to go through, we're going to be more radical for some in here than others. But at the end of six weeks, each of us will undoubtedly have identified at least one of those, these, uh, these uh, challenges from him will be pertinent in our lives. The sermon title and scripture are located on the Arbor Point Google calendar. If you want to see what's coming up, it's Be Anxious for Nothing is Today. I'm going to talk next week about sell all your things and give to the poor. Woo-hoo! <laughs> Become a servant. Deny yourself and follow me. Yeah, denial, that's what I want to do. I want to deny what I want. Not everybody enters the kingdom. Uh-oh. Well, that's, that's, that's a little scary. Love your enemies. Are you crazy? So we'll finish there. <laughs> After that, we're going to go through Ephesians, uh, six weeks in the book of the writing of Paul to the church at Ephesus. But today we're tackling a topic that really impacts most of us, if not all of us, at one time or another. Be anxious for nothing. And, and let me just say, it's a wonderful statement. I love this statement, be anxious for nothing. I, I, I think it sounds good. And, it, and anybody who struggles with anxiety and worry would absolutely love having a spiritual solution that helps them be anxious for nothing. It falls in the category of this is one of those easier said than done kind of things, you know, because we tend to, you know, to, we have control issues. We have a desire for what we want over what God wants. And releasing our will, letting Jesus be Lord, not just Savior of our life, but allowing him to have lordship over all is not an easy thing because he doesn't talk to me the way, you know. I can't just go to down, <laughs> go down here to, to, to the grove and go, okay, Jesus, have a seat. We're going to have a conversation. I can talk to him, but he's not 
I don't get that back and forth, you know, and I have to listen very carefully. I have to spend time to try to discern where it is and what it is that God would have me and actually Arbor Point to be doing. So our primary passage is out of Luke 12, 22 through 34. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Why, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now Jesus also teaches this on a sermon. We went through this a couple years ago when we were <clears throat> doing the journey. We went through the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew 6, 19 through 34, you'll recognize some of this teaching. He taught it more than once is my point. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness." No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his or her span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. They grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Amen? You know, I, I, I do this thing sometimes where I'll bring in three glasses. It makes a mess, though, so I think I did it here once. It goes all over the place. But, you know, so you have yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And yesterday's glass was full, right? It, it was full. And, and tomorrow's glass was, is, is, you know, is, is going to be full. And, and today is full. But when you start putting yesterday in it and tomorrow in it, you just make a mess of things. It just goes everywhere. You know, sufficient is the day. For the day is its own trouble. And there's a lot of passages, but we want to, we're going to stay focused on our, a lot in this passage, but we're going to stay focused on our primary concept of the day, which is be anxious for nothing. See, approximately 90% of the people in Jesus' first century context were poor. They were living in abject poverty. They didn't have much. Life was difficult. Life expectancy was low in comparison to modern times, and that's who he's talking to. So in that context... Where they're barely surviving, Jesus says, don't worry about it. I got you. Don't worry about your life. Be anxious for nothing. 
I don't, and I don't think Jesus was being flippant or naive, but affirming that by focusing on the possibilities of God in our lives, when we focus kingdom first, is in each of these passages, when we put the kingdom first and we focus on Christ first, and the possibilities of God in our lives, that then we can have those fears quieted. Because God is with us. We are sons and daughters of the king. We are grafted into the vine of, 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 of Abraham's lineage. We are part of a bigger story. And your story is important in the context of the story. I came across this when I was researching ways to deal with anxiety in general, and it just kind of caught my eye. It might be uh, something that somebody, I haven't seen one around here, so it might be something that somebody takes on. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, at a business park just outside Houston, in northwest Houston, laid-off worker named Sean Baker had launched a strange business encouraging people to take out their frustrations on household furniture. Anybody here, here in these rooms? Yes, Tantrums LLC. Uh, so so <laughs> it invites frustrated Houstonians to demolish rooms full of stuff with sledgehammers and other implements of destruction. So they have face shields, you got all this gear on, you get to go in. You can rent a room, 10 minutes, 15, and destroy the contents of the room. Whatever he puts in, he says, this baker, he says, whatever I put in there, you can destroy it, either with golf, ball, golf clubs, baseball bat, lead pipes, sledgehammers, whatever else I can think of that I'm going to put in there. And customers choose their instruments of destruction. They walk into the room equipped with furniture from dishes to desks to TV sets to household appliances. Then they start smashing everything in sight to smithereens. And Baker dreamed up the idea for her business after attending a concert where they were smashing old furniture. I wonder what that band was. I don't know. They pulled their, well, the old who would have done it. They smashed all their gear. <laughs> <laughs> they pulled their trucks in behind the bar and started unloading all this stuff, and they were just beating the, beating the stuff out of it. I looked at my husband, and I said, that's it. That's it right there. How, how about that for a light bulb? That's how we're going to make a living. So she found the site. They put it together, and, and she, she said that the two of the first three bookings were, <laughs> were stay-at-home moms. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think stay-at-home moms aren't stressed. You know, they you know, and the next was teachers. So, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> for 10 minutes, it's 35 bucks. For 15 minutes, it's $50. If you need more than that, you probably need professional help. <laughs> That's certainly a technique that costs less than an hour with a therapist, but I don't know how biblical it is. It just caught my eye. People are trying to figure out how to deal with stress and anxiety all over the world. They're trying to figure out how can, I'm going nuts. How can I deal with that? Let me get it out. So what do we do as followers of Christ when our anxieties are overwhelming our thought process? I have a thought. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Such a simple but very profound song because in it is a key for us in releasing anxiety. Instead of focusing on the source of our anxiety, focus on the one who overcame even death and who's right now seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. In other words, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's a radical concept in our day and age to be so focused on Jesus, so focused on him, that the things around him become a blur. They, they don't become the main thing anymore. Because I'm looking, I'm looking at Jesus, and the things of, of earth can grow, can grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. For the kids, we need to invent a game called Focus on Jesus. You know, you know a video game of some kind. That, so, so your goal, the outcome of this is, is you got to find Jesus and follow him. You know, it's Just a thought. Somebody out there make a lot of money with it. Look, our era now is filled with stimuli from every direction. 
You know, you can't walk anywhere without something, you know, our, we're tied to our phones now, we're tied to, and our phones are no longer just a phone, now our phones get us the internet and they carry our Bible, lots of good things and lots of bad things can happen with it, you know, we're so connected that it's difficult to focus just on him. The daily challenge, something we have to be intentional about and choose or it just won't happen. You know, the world has no problem at all taking all the time that we have and using it for just whatever. Dragging us off to the left, dragging us off to the right. If we want to become followers of him, then we have to be intentional about it. You know, my background is counseling, so in cognitive, I wanted to just throw it out there. Cognitive behavioral therapy, because Jesus was ahead of his time. <laughs> the process goes something like this. There's an activating event, an, an external stimuli, for example. A husband late coming home and he hasn't called. That's the A part. The B is beliefs. We have beliefs about that. This is where we, where we do our work if we want to lessen our anxiety. So the event, husband late coming home. Uh, so you can go irrational with that. Oh, my God, he's, he's, in a, he's in a wreck and he's died. Or, oh, no, he's out cheating on me. And what's going to happen then? The consequence of that, your emotions are going to, your anxieties will just explode. But what if instead of that, you had, well, he's probably caught in traffic. And it's okay. He'll be here shortly. Then that, the emotional response can go down. And the consequence is going to come one way or the other. You're gonna, whether you're rational or irrational, you're going to respond to that. That's called the consequence, but it's just the reaction to the behavior. It's going to either drive you, your anxiety up, or you choose differently. You dispute what your thought is, what your belief is, to lower your anxiety. And then you end up in a better place. In our passage, Jesus is answering a question with a parable. So they had asked him, these, these two brothers came up and they had an inheritance. And so he said, well, my brother's not letting me have my inheritance. And Jesus, being Jesus, uh, took a parable out of his kit. He said, I'm going to tell him the parable of the farmer. You know? And so he talks about this farmer. And what he had done, he had a great year. He had surplus. His way more than what he imagined he could ever have. So he decided he was going to tear down his barns and his silos and he was going to build bigger ones so that he could hold all this surplus. And he'd be set and he wouldn't have to work so hard going forward. And then this happened. You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. A belief that would have led to that action is, I can't trust God to provide so I'll do it myself. And I know good and well, there's some folks in here right now who go, yeah, that's, I do that. You know, I, I can't trust him, so I'll do it myself. Once done with this parable, Jesus speaks to his disciples and begins to dispute the irrational belief that God would not take care of his people because God will take care of his people. God will provide. And having God in your life can quiet your fears. Jesus. Just focus on that one word in the center. What do you see? Not rhetorical. What do you see? Say it, say it out. Comforter. Comforter. Lori, what do you got? Bright light, absolutely. Jesus is the light of the world. What do you see when you look at that? What comes to your mind? Shepherd. Peace. Savior. See, when we focus on Jesus, are those thoughts that are going to lift your, raise your anxiety, or are those thoughts that are going to comfort you and, and bring your anxiety down? When we get worked up, There's no better place to look than him. Now I've lost my place, and I've got to go back. I didn't really. God does what God does on Sunday morning. He never goes how I practice. <laughs> That's the way it is. Isaiah 26.3. It's the Old Testament. 
you know. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. Why? Because they trust in you. The world we live in today is one where fear and anxiety is being utilized as a tool to divide us and place us against one another. So much of the public discourse now is pitting one side against the other, not just pitting us against each other, but making the other side evil. If I, you know, it, if I can make that side evil, then evil is bad, so now I can get rid of that side. Instead of just having a disagreement, we've stopped talking to each other. We've got to learn how to do that. We've got to learn how to talk to each other and disagree again, somehow, some way. We've got to learn. You know, that we, we may not agree on stuff, but, but we can hear each other, and it doesn't make the other person evil. They're just different. They don't believe like we believe. They're wrong, but still. No, sorry. <laughs> People are allowed to be wrong from my perspective. They don't have to agree with me. It's okay. But we have stopped that talking and Actual conversations where we try to work with one another are few and far between. We only argue with each other. We don't listen well. And I, look, I'm as worried about this country as anybody, I think, because, you know, 25, 50, 100 years from now, I, I don't know what it's going to be, you know, and I worry about that. Probably shouldn't. I should probably look at uh, that. <laughs> you know who's going to be here 25, 50, 100 years from now? <laughs> you know who ain't? <laughs> Jesus did not come to accommodate culture, but to counter culture. He is so reliable, so reliable. And the divisiveness, the fear, the anxiety provoking of the world is the opposite of what Jesus is telling us. It's the opposite. He's, we, are, we have feet shod with the gospel of peace, which makes us carriers of peace, not divisiveness. And in our passage, he's telling us, don't worry about, don't spend your time worrying about stuff that doesn't matter. You're more valuable than birds, more beautiful than flowers. One day, when our time here is done, we're going to go to a far better place for the rest of eternity. But while we're here, we're kingdom people. We have the opportunity to bring peace everywhere that we go. To, dis to show the how to how to disagree and not have to beat anybody up, but just to disagree with them in a, in a way that... You know, both sides can walk out going, okay, well, that was a good conversation. This is uh, it's something I came across as well. It's anonymous. Worry is fear. I'll read it. So it's not small. Worry is fear's extravagance. It extracts its interest on trouble before it comes due. It constantly drains the energy God gives us to face daily problems and to fulfill our many responsibilities. It is, therefore, a sinful waste. A woman who had lived long enough to have learned some important truths about life remarked this. I've had a lot of trouble, most of which never happened. <laughs> she had worried about many things that had never occurred and had come to see the total futility of her anxieties. If we choose to trust in God for all things then we will not fear what we used to fear. Paul pretty much sung, sums things up in Philippians 4. I'm going to read it from the message and from the NIV because they're both powerful. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean revel in him. Doesn't that sound good? I mean revel in him. Revel in him. Celebrate. What's that going to do for your anxiety and your worry? Yeah, you start the day out celebrating God and reveling in who he is. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean revel in it. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them, not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, Pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Jesus. 
Be the Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things that are true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Put into practice what you have learned from me, what you've heard and saw and realized. Do that. And God, who, the God who makes everything work together will work you into his most excellent harmonies. Harmony. What's a harmony, Mike? So, so you got the melody, but then you got harmonies above and below, and and when all of that comes together perfectly, what, what does that sound like? Perfectly. It's beautiful. You know, it's it's just an amazing thing when 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 chords come together and and and, and notes come together, and and it's an excellent harmony. In the NIV, it's rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The Lord is not far away. The Lord is with you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. The God of peace will be with you. Do not conform to the pattern of the world. Jesus came to, to counter culture. Don't buy into the divisiveness, the hate, the animosity. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind through prayer, study, strong fellowship with Christians, coming to church on Sundays, being where you can be, where you can grow in your faith. Be different. Be different. You are different. You're supposed to be different. Followers of Christ are supposed to be noticeable by how we love one another. Be different. Love one another. Love God. Witness of that love to others. Your story is part of his story. And the world needs our story. It needs our story. It needs your story. And don't worry. God's got you. Every week that I remember it, we say this. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, which is critical. And behold, there's a promise. Say it with me. I am with you sometimes. <laughs> I am occasionally with you. That's not what it says. I am with you always to the end of the age. If you are a person struggling with worry and anxiety, make Philippians 4 your, your homepage. Because when we do the things that Paul writes about, you know, Fill your mind and meditate on things that are true and noble and reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. If we're willing to be intentional enough to do that, whenever it, my head runs too, but whenever I go to this passage, it reminds me, God doesn't want me all worked up out of sorts. He wants me to focus on, Mike, there's good things in your life. There's good people in your life. You're not alone, just whatever your head says, you know? And he is with me always, even to the end of the age, and he's with you too. We don't travel alone. 